It's booming and fast. Even before the pandemic, Greater Geelong had the third largest growth of any region in the country. And since lockdowns hit, the Geelong region has trailed only the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast in attracting people fleeing from capital cities. And the council's working on the theory that during the pandemic, the growth rate surged from 2.7 to 3% a year. What does that mean? Well, if that rate continues, by 2036, the region will have doubled in size in just 25 years. It's estimated that Geelong's annual retail spending will reach almost $6 billion by 2036, needing 400,000 square metres of extra retail floor space, the equivalent of eight more large shopping centres. Some analysts estimate the region will need about 30 more primary schools and 10 more secondary schools over the next 15 years. A large part of the growth for Geelong is in the thousands more public servants going to be based here. The TAC started the trend a decade ago, now there's something of a hub. The NDIS headquarters here, just down the road, the WorkSafe headquarters, and around the corner a new council building that alone will centralise 900 employees. But about 70% of the region's growth is expected in areas still being developed. These western and northern corridors alone are slated for more new residents than currently live in Ballarat. But much of the infrastructure is still a long way away. So we know the region will be bigger, but how will the new Greater Geelong handle its growing pains? So that's the central question we'll be looking at in this spotlight over the next few weeks on Geelong and this region. And infrastructure, or the lack of it, will be crucial. Take public transport. It'll become more and more important as road congestion is set to skyrocket over the next few decades. Well, many people say that the system here at the moment just isn't up to scratch. And that includes school buses. Some buses are so crowded, some kids are having to sit on the floor. One of our Geelong-based reporters, Erin Cooper, has the story. The scenic town of Ocean Grove on the Bellarine Peninsula is known for its relaxed lifestyle. But every weekday, it has its own morning rush hour on local school buses. My son's actual words, it is so um, crammed in their mum, especially of an afternoon, that I'm finding it hard to breathe. Narelle Hinson pays $700 a year for her two children to fight for a seat. They either have to stand in the aisles or I have also heard and um, know of children sitting in the aisles. They've had to sit or stand in the stairwell as well. Ms Hinson's complained to the bus company and Public Transport Victoria about the safety of the children on board, but nothing's come of it. The growth has continued and it's been more so over the last two years um, and it seems that the bus companies haven't taken that into account. Congestion is fast becoming a big issue for the Geelong region, both inside school buses and on the roads. Data commissioned by the region's Council Alliance, G21, forecasts that by 2041, traffic delays in Geelong's morning peak hour will be up by 566%. Drivers will only average 36 kilometres per hour in the morning peak, and key arterial roads will exceed their capacity. While the school buses are packed, the data shows general buses are being underused, with just 3% of the population regularly getting on board. Geelong will likely remain car dependent in coming decades, but many people say that's because the local public transport network just isn't a good enough alternative. They could run a little bit later, that would be great. Um, and just making sure like the PTV app was updated correctly, that would be fantastic for me. I will use it more if it was better. Yeah, definitely. I think it could use some improvement, definitely. So I would definitely use it if it was better and faster then I wouldn't have to own a car. The frequency of buses at night time is not that great after 8 o'clock in the uh, further suburbs and not so good in the city and close by after 9 o'clock. Dylan Barmby lives just 50 metres from a bus stop, but getting on board isn't an option. I work in hospitality, so it sort of rules me out of being able to, to use it for a commute. I could go. 
He has to drive to his bar job because when he finishes around 9pm, there's no public transport to get him home. Population's really booming in town and I feel like the public transport hasn't really come along with that at all. The Public Transport Users Association is calling for more funding. The increased, improved, more frequent bus service is vital and it's up to the state government to commit to that and to reduce Geelong's car dependence and increase our non-car mobility by committing to uh, the necessary funding. G21 is also pushing hard for urgent action. What we're trying to avoid here is the kind of congestion that we're seeing in metropolitan parts of Melbourne. We'd really like to get this right. It's a once in a generation opportunity to get the planning done and to get ahead of the problem. The Department of Transport says school bus safety is the top priority, but no more buses will be put on at Ocean Grove as they're not over capacity. It also says it'll plan the bus network in Geelong in line with the region's development, including future rail. But with such rapid growth already happening, the risk is authorities will be playing catch up for years. Erin Cooper, ABC News, Geelong. Well, not only is the Geelong region growing physically and culturally, electorally it's become one of the most significant focal points in both state and federal politics. Victorian voters will be going to the polls twice this year for the state election in November and for the federal election sometime before May. State political reporter Richard Willingham explains what's up for grabs here. It's the centrepiece of Geelong and a key to the cat's success over many years. The Cadinia Park is also a monument to election pledges, a symbol of the region's rapid growth, which has become critical to state and federal politics. Both Labor and Liberal, federal and state governments have poured and promised hundreds of millions of dollars into Cadinia Park's redevelopment. And on the eve of two big elections, its final stage is starting to take shape. Geelong, the Bellarine and the Surf Coast is politically the most marginal area outside of Melbourne and it will be again this year. Federally there's two seats, the very safe seat of Corio, held by Labor, and Corangamite, which includes Torquay. It's the seventh most marginal seat in the country. Since 2007 it's swung between the major parties, which has prompted billions of dollars in election promises for road upgrades, surf clubs and swimming pools. In 2019 the coalition promised two billion dollars for a fast train between Melbourne and Geelong, but it's yet to gather steam. Labor's Libby Coker is favourite to hold the seat, but the Liberals do believe they have a chance with former Mayor Stephanie Asher. In state politics, the area is represented by five seats. Three are very safe for the government. Labor holds South Barwon, but it has swung between the major parties, while new boundaries have made Liberal-held Polworth more marginal. As the area continues to expand, it's up to political parties to convince voters it's best place to deal with the growing pains while also contending with the increasing number of voters who are fed up with the status quo. Richard Willingham, ABC News, Geelong.